Today's study tip, each lecture I will present you with a new study tip and I highly recommend that you um, apply them, that you try them out. Okay, so today's study tip, for auditory learners, and if you're not sure what your learning style is, go to the student success folder, or module rather, and look through the materials. I have included a uh, document that helps you learn about what the different learning styles are and how to identify yours. Um, I believe in the syllabus I might have provided you with a link to a quiz, uh, but you could also just Google um, determine my learning style or learning style free quiz, right? There's lots of them. Uh, remember, the more questions, the better or more reliable a um, quiz will be. Okay, so if you think you're an auditory learner or you know you're an auditory learner, then these recorded lectures are perfect for you. When you are in an in-person class instead of an online class, then you simply just ask your instructor if you have their permission to record them while they lecture, and you could use your phone or you could buy a separate recording device um, or even a tablet, um, and you could record it that way. And then that way you could review it at a later time. Now, since this is an online class and I, ha I am recording all these lectures, you can just re-listen to it um, so at least one of the times that you go through this lecture, make sure you are looking at the slides and taking notes, right? But uh, re-listening, you could do that while like going for a run, right? Or walking. Um, you can listen to it in the car. You don't necessarily need to be stuck in traffic. <laughs> um, you could listen to it while you're doing chores and cleaning, right? So um, lots and lots of ways that you can re-listen to these, which I recommend for most people, even if you don't think you're an auditory learner, um, repetition is key, right? And we need to do repetition in lots of different ways. So repetition can be listening to the lecture a couple times, right? Uh, reading your book, taking notes, reorganizing your notes, and then you need to do something different like uh, practice questions or making up your own questions, doing a study group, talking to each other, tr uh, testing out your memory and your ability to explain concepts, right? All right, moving on. Today is chapter two, chemistry of life. We will review things that you've probably learned before um, between your lower division uh, chemistry and biology classes. You should already know all this. Um, so water, what properties of water and why water is important for us. Um, acids, bases, pH, the pH system, buffers, salts, carbohydrates, fatty acids. Um, so for fat, we talk about fatty acids, lipids, triglycerides, cholesterol, steroids. And then we'll talk about proteins. And then lastly, we'll talk about uh, genetic or uh, nucleic acid, right? So DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid, RNA, ribonucleic acid. And then ATP, lastly, the energy of the cell, ATP. Okay, so water. Oh, right, like I said, this chapter's review for you. Right, chemistry is one of the prereqs for this class. Uh, so make sure that you go back and review atoms, chemical bonds, molecules, and the functional groups of organic molecules. Uh, I will not be going over those in today's lecture, so you need to uh, read up on those, uh, sharpen up, okay? And then the most important chemistry for this class is what's on the outline that I just went over, and that's what we'll be talking about. So. Now, water. So these are just some really neat images. You do not need to memorize these uh, percentages or anything like that. But I wanted you to get an idea um, that your blood and your liver, right, and your kidneys, these are, you know, above 80% composed of water. So right right there you can see how vital water is to the body and of course your brain 75 percent muscles are also 75 percent water 
um, the heart is 79% water, right? So your bones are the most dense part of your body and they have the least amount of water, but they still are composed of 22% water. So I just thought that was interesting and kind of fun. Um, like I said, do not, you do not need to memorize that. Um, something that you will see later in this class and you'll memorize it at that point is this um, kind of ratio between where the water is in the body. So you know you have uh, water in every single cell. So when we say the brain is 75% water, what that means is all the cells within the brain contain water and it equals overall 75% of the brain. Okay, so um, intracellular fluid is what's written here. I know it's very tiny. So intracellular fluid is about 67% of all of the water in your body. That means 67% of all the water in your body is contained within your cells. Interstitial fluid, if you remember, interstitial means between cells. So this is fluid that has left uh, the capillaries of the circulatory system to feed and to nourish your tissues. And, uh, but not all of that fluid gets taken up by the tissues and some of it gets uh, left behind. And some of this will go back into the circulatory system and we'll see that later in this class. But um, the remaining portion will actually get slowly taken up by the lymphatic system. So the lymphatic system plays a key role in uh, both immunology and fluid balance. Okay, so uh, about 26% of fluid in the body is just hanging out in between cells. <laughs> and then we have here this little bit it says intravascular fluid or in other words your blood plasma and that's only about 7% of the total in your body. And then of course you know you have uh, spinal fluid right, cerebrospinal fluid is less than 1% when you compare it to your whole body. All right, so I just, again, you don't have to memorize these uh, yet. You will see this again. Okay, and then this was also interesting from uh, zero to one years, uh, and then as you grow and age, right? So uh, zero to one year olds are, are mostly water, 86%, and that makes sense because they are developing muscle and bone and right? Everything is growing and developing. And then, you know, by the time you are five to 14 year, years old, you're still growing. You're still developing more muscle, more muscle mass, right? Um, but you can see you're down to 75% water. And then by the time you're an adult, you're 65. And then strangely, as you get older and older, you start to become even less um, and that's something I actually am not certain what the physiological reason is for. So that could be one of the topics you talk about in your uh, weekly discussions. You can, you can look into this and you can propose your own ideas and you can uh, give explanations that you've found in research and you can teach me and the rest of the class. Okay, so what is the reason for so much water in the body, right? So we, part of the reason is temperature control. Part of the reason is uh, cushioning, right? So uh, a great example of cushioning would be a, a baby, right? Is surrounded in amniotic fluid to um, help cushion and protect it. Um, you know, you have um, millions, I mean, millions is, is an understatement. You have trillions of chemical reactions taking place in your body every single day, um, constantly, every moment. You have so many uh, bonds being broken and being formed, and we call those hydrolysis and dehydration synthesis. So hydrolysis would be uh, used to hydro for water, lysis, split apart. So using water to break apart chemical bonds. And then dehydration synthesis would be putting something together by removing water. So dehydrate, remove water, synthesis, put together. Okay. Um, and so then of course, if you have any chemical reactions that are not hydrolysis or dehydration synthesis, you still need a solution for those reactions to take place in. So water, um, one of the 
most important functions of water in the human body is to serve as either a reactant, a product, or a solution for chemical reactions. Okay. Um, let's look at some properties of water now. Okay, so water. Water is called inorganic, and if you remember, the definition of organic means to be carbon-based. So, of course, water doesn't have any carbon, so therefore it's inorganic. It's also polar, and what that means is that you have these partial charges. On one end, you have a partial charge of a negative, and that comes from oxygen. Oxygen's highly electronegative, meaning it wants to hold on to electrons, and so it's actually going to have the electrons from these hydrogens most of the time, and very little of the time the hydrogen will have it. So they do share electrons, right? As we know is the definition of this bond that's being made here, covalent bond. Um, but it doesn't share equally. So the oxygen will have the electrons the majority of the time, and that's how it gets this negative charge. And of course, by default, the hydrogen doesn't have electrons the majority of the time, and so it will have a positive slight or partial charge, right? So these are not true charges, these are partial charges. And it's polar because one end is negative and the other end is positive, okay? All of life, all types of life require water, okay? Um, and we have some really neat properties of water we're going to look at in addition to being inorganic and polar we have this cohesion of water molecules, and that is actually due to the polar nature of water. And so cohesion, meaning they like to stick to each other. So another molecule of water is going to be attracted, right, the negative end of the next molecule is gonna be attracted to this positive portion. And I believe I have a picture of that uh, that we'll see in a moment. So hydrogen bonds, right, the attraction between um, a negative charge and this positive charge. Hydrogen bonds hold molecules of water together. And these are weak, the weakest type of bonds. I don't know if you heard that weird noise going on outside. Um, I live by a lot of ducks and geese, but I think there's also a dog being walked outside. <laughs> so sorry if you're hearing weird noises. Okay. Um, so where was I? Hydrogen bonds, which are these very weak bonds that are in between molecules of water. So this individual water molecule is not held together by hydrogen bonds, it's, it's covalent. But if you get another molecule of water and put it next to it, it's going to form a hydrogen bond. Um, and so then you get this uh, adhesion or surface tension, and you can see surface tension is best demonstrated in this picture here where um, this I forget what kind of bug this is um, some type of glider um, is able to actually walk on water because it doesn't break the surface tension it's able to um, distribute its weight enough to uh, be less force than the force of all the hydrogen bonds uh, that make the adhesion uh, surface tension. So that's really cool. The adhesion property you can also see in this cup of water here is water has been able to be stacked on top of itself quite a bit above the actual level of the glass and it's not dripping over. Of course if you don't do this very slowly uh, you will, the force of adding water can overcome the surface tension or adhesion property and then you will lose the water. So if you're bored at home <laughs> and you wanna fill a glass to the brim and then get a dropper and slowly dropwise add more and more water, you can get this to happen. That That's maybe fun um, if you have some extra time on your hands. Okay, next, high specific heat. You know this when you're hungry and you try to make some something you need to boil uh, so you, you get a pot, right, you get a pot out, you fill it with water from the tap, 
you put it on the stove, you blast it on high heat, it still takes, what, 10 minutes to boil? Depends on how much water you have. Um, and you're, and it feels like a very long time when you're really hungry and waiting, right? So why does it take so long for water to boil, but something like milk boils um, really quickly, right? And the difference here is because there are so many hydrogen bonds forming between every single molecule of water that it makes overall it it's able to take on a lot of heat before those molecules gain energy and become a gas right so the amount of energy required to change just one gram of water by one degree celsius is this the actual fancy definition that you learned in chemistry for specific heat right um and we call this high latent heat of vaporization, meaning it takes all that energy to break the hydrogen bonds so that your water molecules can actually gain energy and change phase from liquid to vapor. Mm. Okay, so let's recap a little bit. Because water is highly polar, it readily forms hydrogen bonds and therefore has cohesion, adhesion, surface tension, and high heat capacity. So all of these really awesome properties of water are due to hydrogen bonds, and the hydrogen bonds are due to this polar property of water, okay? Um, and so I, I've given you some examples in these pictures. Another example of cohesion, uh, water sticking on itself would be um, hydrogen bonds will allow water molecules to adhere to each other. Non-water molecules like the side of a cup or the cells of the lining of the tree's uh, xylem, right? So we, we see water sticking to itself and the side of the cup. We also know that how plants are able to drink Use, we'll use the word drink. I'm making little quotation signs with my hands. Uh, they can absorb water from the ground um, because water sticks to itself, but it also sticks to, to the xylem or the, the water vesicles of the plant. And then it's able to climb and it keeps climbing up and up and up due to these properties of water. Okay. Um, so Plants are able to get water up against gravity, against gravity, without having to use energy. So that's pretty spectacular. Okay, and then we talked about the high specific heat or high heat capacity, meaning that uh, water actually resists large temperature fluctuations because it's able to absorb so much heat before you actually uh, change the temperature and why again because it has so many hydrogen bonds okay um, and so this is another reason that we have so much water in the body is it stabilizes our body temperature this is also why when you live near the ocean it stays it never gets super super cold and it never gets super 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 hot right or it's very unusual let's say uh, you can get weird uh, weather systems that change that. But day to day, throughout the year, right, you have very average or temperate temperatures. And that's because you're by this huge body of water that's taking up tons and tons and tons of energy instead of it um, just being bouncing off of ground and, and heating up the air. It, the water actually absorbs it. All right, so hopefully you found this interesting and you learned something about water. Um, another reason that uh, water is important is that it does something different than all other um, liquids on earth. It actually, water will actually expand when it freezes. And you know this, you've made ice, I'm sure, um, at some point, or you've, you've frozen something. And it, if you're not careful, it will go up past the container you've put it in or if it's a closed container, you might have something break, right? Um, so it expands when it freezes. Everything else, everything else, when you freeze it, it becomes more 
dense, right? Like think of a piece of bread, okay? Um, bread, when you put it in, is fluffy, light, and airy. When you freeze it, it becomes more dense and solid, right? Um, water, on the other hand, expands, becomes less dense. And that's why um, we can have lakes, right? If, if, think about in the winter, I know in California we don't really see this, but if you go up into the mountains or you go to another state where it gets um, below freezing long enough, the top of the uh, lake, right, freezes over and it stays there. If it got more dense like every other liquid on earth, it would sink. And if the ice sank, it would kill all the things living in below it, right? Um, living in the water. So this is another uh, really neat property of water. So water's super cool and we take it for granted every day. All right, and of course, it's the universal solvent, right? We know lots and lots of, uh, lots and lots and lots of different substances or chemicals are dissolved in water. Okay, so this is the picture I was telling you, I would show you that, okay, you have covalent bonds, the solid line, for one molecule of water, right? So the hydrogen and the oxygen are covalently bonded together for an individual molecule of water. But when you put multiple molecules of water next to each other, they are going to form hydrogen bonds between the partial positive on the hydrogen and the partial negative on the oxygen. You get a weak bond called a hydrogen bond. It becomes strong when you have hundreds of millions of hydrogen bonds, then each of those hydrogen bonds can take a little bit of energy um, in order to break it, right? And so that's why boiling water takes a while or water has a high heat capacity. Okay, um, and then this is a picture to show you how what a dissolving salt looks like. So you have, uh, Salt, NaCl, will dissociate into Na plus and Cl minus, right? So this is an ionic bond. It's an ionic compound. And you're going to form ions, sodium and chloride, okay? And each of those, the reason it's said to be dissolved is because it's going to be completely surrounded by water. And notice the orientation. The partial or the, the positive charge on this ion this is actually a positive charge, is going to be attracted to the partial negative charges on the oxygen of the water. But for a chloride, which is negatively charged, you're going to have the positive hydrogens attracted to it. So the water will orient itself, the water molecules flip around, right, and orient themselves so the charges opposites attract, right? Okay. Um, I, I mentioned dehydration synthesis is the removal of water to put two things together. And so this is an image of that. So you have a molecule of sugar glucose and another molecule of the same thing. So you have two glucose molecules side by side for this example. But on the bottom example, we have glucose and fructose. So just keep in mind that it's not just between glucose and glucose. You can have um, pretty much any two sugars put together. Uh, and we also do this for building fats, lipids. We do this for building proteins, right? All of the, um, all of the organic molecules in the body are put together through dehydration synthesis, okay? So getting back to our example, you'll have a hydrogen on one molecule and an OH group on the other that are lost or given up. And when you give up an H plus an OH, that's going to form water. So essentially you've removed water uh, from these two molecules and then a bond will form in this place. So here you have the bond, right? So the oxygen here will become bonded to the carbon over here. And so that's what you see. All right. Um, review this, read about it in your book, and let me know if you have any questions. The opposite would be hydrolysis, splitting two things apart using water. And so keeping that same example that we just saw, 
with two uh, glucose molecules side by side connected right here, you could um, you could start splitting those apart, right, by adding water. And so here it's shown that if you add the water, you can split apart and get the two molecules of glucose. Okay. And again, you can look at this in your textbook if you are not following. And then you can also ask me in office hours. Okay, acids and bases. Acids are going to give up protons called H plus or hydrogens, okay? And of course this is in a solution. So they are called the proton donor and it's an acid because it's increasing the concentration of protons in a solution. Bases are going to do the opposite. They're going to lower the uh, proton level in a solution by accepting or binding to it, right, forming bonds. And so some common acids and bases that you probably know, hydrochloric acid, HCl, it's a strong acid because it completely dissociates in solution, right? Um, and then come back to like carbonic acid and that's a weak acid, it will only partially dissociate. So it's not going to give off as many um, hydrogens per uh, unit, right? As would a hydrochloric acid. And then bases, we have the same thing, sodium hydroxide, NaOH, strong base. Um, you, you might not be so familiar with these other bases and that's fine. You don't need to memorize all of these. This is just to jog your memory, okay. All right, pH. So what is pH? As you know, pH is used to tell us about the concentration of uh, protons, or hydrogen plus, right, H plus, um, in a solution. And how we do that? Well, we have a scale from zero to 14, right? So if you say that the pH is 14, it would be a super strong base, good, or alkaline. How do we calculate pH? You take the, oh, our spacing got a little off, Right, this should be directly underneath. But I think you understand. Okay, so you're gonna take the log of a fraction, and that fraction's gonna be one over the total amount of hydrogens in a solution. And that's why you get this this weird like the more hydrogen you have in a solution, the smaller your number is. Right? So if you've ever thought it's weird, acids have a lot as an acidic solution has a lot of hydrogen, yet we give it a number like zero to seven. It's because you're taking one over the concentration of protons and then taking the log of that. So you're, the bigger this number on the bottom of a fraction gets, the smaller your, your number will be. Um, also wanna point out whenever you see these brackets, that is shorthand for concentration. And I use that a lot in this class. Okay. Um, so pure water, not necessarily tap water, tap water has minerals, uh, but pure water that's been highly filtered would be neutral and have a pH of 7. Acids will range from 0 to 7, the strongest being 0, the weakest being um, approaching 7. Bases, anything above 7 is a base, and of course the strongest base would be 14. And by the way, people tend to be really afraid of acids, but you should be equally, if not more, afraid of bases. Um, they will hurt you as well. So whenever you work with acids or bases, you should be wearing all of your protective, all right, PPO, personal protective equipment, um, PPE, not PPO, PPE, personal protective equipment, gloves, goggles, lab coat, hairs pulled back, right? Okay, so what, a little bit more about acids, bases, and add in salt. Okay, so an acid plus a base is how you make a salt. Uh, so you can look at HCl, acid, base, hydroxide, sodium hydroxide. So hydrochloric acid and sodium hydroxide, if you put them together, you will form salt, NaCl, table salt, and water. Look how nicely color-coded I made this. Okay, so electrolytes, you know you drink things like Gatorade for the electrolytes. Um, 
and electrolytes dissociate, right? They're salts and they dissociate uh, and they conduct electricity. So you know that when you become severely dehydrated, you need to not only have water, but you need to have some electrolytes so that electricity is properly conducted in your body. Um, some salts can also be used as buffers. Buffers uh, resist change to pH. So let me say that one more time. Buffers resist change in pH. And so we will talk a lot about buffers in this class, um, more towards the end of the semester. Um, so here's the pH scale, uh, which you already know, right? Zero, super strong acid, all the way to 14, super strong base. Um, why did I put this here? Wish I could remember. Okay, so I think I wanted to start talking to you about um, molarity versus uh, molality. So in this class we use little m, which is molality, and this is saying that one mole of the solute has been dissolved in exactly one liter of water. Whereas capital M, molarity, is putting in the one mole of your um, stuff, one mole of your uh, reagent, and then you add water until you reach a total volume of one liter. So when you do capital M, molarity, you have added a little less than one liter of water because the, uh, the reagent, the powder or salt that you've added is taking up some of that space. So when you look at the bottle, you've added water to the one liter line. And so you have exactly one liter of solution but less than one liter of water right but when you use molality m-o-l-a-l-i-t-y molality you add exactly one liter of water and you add your uh, mole of uh, salt or solute right and so then your total volume level will be just over the liter mark and that's what we use in physiology. So that's why I'm telling you about this. We use molality, exactly one liter of water. Okay, so it's, it's a little m. Now, what else did I wanna tell you? Remember that organic acids, things that you know are like acetic or vinegar, acetic acid, um, citric acid. Uh, of course, you know about lactic acid, the burning feeling when you work out and your muscles get that burn, that lactic acid buildup, right? And there are other organic acids. And what they all have in common is something called a carboxyl group, which remember you're taking the, upon yourself to review your organic functional groups. So make sure you know carboxyl, what a carboxyl group is. C-O-O-H, carboxyl, okay? So organic acids have carboxyl groups. There's also ketones that you need to review and know. A ketone, C double bond O, uh, is called a carbonyl group. And there will be uh, some carbon chain attached to it as well. And ketones will have a lot of talk in this class. And then um, an organic molecule is considered an alcohol if it has a hydroxyl group. So that OH group is a hydroxyl group. So those are the three most important functional groups that you need to know. Carboxyl, carbonyl, and hydroxyl, okay? Uh, you should also know what a hydrocarbon is. Okay. So buffers, as I mentioned, resist change in pH. So buffers are molecules that slow the change in pH by either combining with protons, so if you're adding protons, it's gonna take them up so that the pH doesn't change, or if you are adding something that's um, binding the free protons already in the solution, then the buffer is going to release more, again, so that you don't change the pH. Uh, buffers are composed of a weak acid and a weak base, so that they will release more or less protons as needed or 
bind and take up more or less protons as needed. Okay, so the bicarbonate buffer system used in our blood to maintain our normal blood pH 7.35 to 7.45. The system looks like this. It's made of a weak acid. The weak acid is called carbonic acid and a weak base called bicarbonate or bicarbonate ion. And when you have an accumulation of uh, protons in the blood, it will cause more of the carbonic acid to be made and less dissociation of the by of the weak acid um, which is a shift to the left so essentially you'll, you'll end up with more water and more co2 um, if you were to have a drop in the concentration of protons then you would shift this equation to the right so for now I'm not going to ask you about shifting. I'm just going to want you to know uh, what um, uh, a buffer is made up of a weak acid and a weak base. Its job is to, or what a buffer does, is slows changes in pH or resists change to pH by either releasing or binding with protons. And that the main buffer system in the blood is the bicarbonate buffer system and the normal range of blood is 7.35 to 7.45 okay now carbohydrates cell structures inside and outside of the cell can be composed of carbohydrates um, they're not the predominant Proteins are the predominant cell structures, but we do have carbohydrate structures as well. Um, but what it is, as an energy source, carbohydrates are the primary, primary energy source for us. All carbohydrates have this ratio of one carbon to every two hydrogen to every one oxygen. And then that is a unit that can repeat any amount of times and one example of what that looks like is this ring down here so you have one two three four five and six carbons so monosaccharides are simple sugars they can be as little as three carbons a small little chain or they can form rings up to seven carbons so this is on the bigger side because it was six carbons. What are examples of monosaccharides? Ribose, as an RNA, has a ribose sugar in it. Deoxyribose, right, DNA, has a very similar sugar, and we'll take a look at that in a, in a few minutes. Glucose, you're very familiar with. Fructose and galactose, and you might not know about galactose, we will take a look at it right now. So gl glucose, galactose, and fructose all have the identical chemical formula, C6H12O6, but they are different molecules because of their structure, how they're put together. So glucose and galactose are different, barely. They're barely different, but they are different. Um, on the side of the, the carbon where the OH is. So they are like, um, it's like taking your right and your left hand, right? They're isomers of each other. And you have glucose and fructose, and even glucose and fructose, they have a lot more differences that are obvious to the eye, right? So the end here, instead of having a double bond, you have two individual hydrogen bonds and an OH, so all single bonds. And then here you have a double bond, which you didn't have over here. Every single one of these, glucose, galactose, and fructose, require their own enzyme in order to do anything whether you're going to break this down to make ATP or you're going to put it together with something else to build something, you need to have a specific enzyme. 
And so just because you have the enzyme for glucose does not mean you have the enzyme for galactose or fructose, right? Um, as humans, we have so many enzymes, but there is an enzyme that's fairly common that people are missing. And that's uh, actually what we'll see when we look at disaccharides. So what is a disaccharide? Two monosaccharide sugars bonded together and of course using dehydration synthesis. So lactose and sucrose. Sucrose is your table sugar. It's made up of glucose and fructose. So those monomers of glucose and fructose are put together and that makes sucrose. Lactose, you take the monomers galactose and glucose and put those together. And of course, lactose is one of those uh, disaccharides that is fairly common for people to not be able to digest, right? You say that they're lactose intolerant and it means they don't have the enzyme to break down lactose, which is um, found in milk. It's a milk sugar. Polysaccharides are long chains, so many, many sugars bonded together. And examples of that would be glycogen, starch, cellulose, and dextrin. Uh, glycogen is how the body stores up sugars, so we'll take a look at that in a second. Starch, you know you eat it all the time, right? Potatoes, bread, any, any complex carbohydrate is going to be made up of starches. Um, and cellulose, you should be familiar with as a plant starch. And this is another example of something um, we don't have an enzyme for. Um, this is called fiber, right? Fiber in your diet. You have two types of fiber, soluble and insoluble and you need a balance to keep everything moving smoothly in your intestines, right? If you have only soluble fiber, it's going to absorb a lot of water and your bowels will slow, slow way down. But if you don't have any soluble fiber or if you don't have enough, then things are going to move way too quickly and you'll have watery stool, okay? So fiber balance is important. What is fiber? Fiber is made up of cellulose, and uh, this is a plant starch that we, it's a plant polysaccharide that we cannot digest because we don't have the enzyme to digest it. In fact, very few organisms on earth are able to digest cellulose. Okay. Um, and dextrin, sometimes you see that in, on food labels, but we're not gonna focus on that. Okay, so glycogen, super important. Uh, if you were to try to store just a bunch of individual molecules of glucose, you would end up retaining a lot of water. If water is going to want to rush in, and you're right because of osmosis, you want to have an equal amount of water to glucose. And of course, you have a bunch of other molecules in your cell that you already um, have water attracted to. And so this would end up making our cells too large and we wouldn't be able to maintain them. So to overcome this water problem, we bind glucose over and over and over again. We make these long strands and we put all these strands of glucose together into this beautiful branched um, molecule called glycogen. And this is great because it means we can still access uh, glucose very quickly. We can store it up in the cell and we, we have overcome the issue of, of too much water trying to come in. Lipids, these are the most energy rich foods. They store, they have lots and lots of bonds, store up lots of energy. They consist of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. We have uh, properties of lipids, they are insoluble in water. You know, oil and water doesn't mix, right? So lipids are fats and oils, right? Nonpolar and hydrophobic. Simple lipids, example of a simple lipid is a monoglyceride, one fatty acid chain attached to one glycerol. A triglyceride is three fatty acids plus one glycerol. And this is 
uh, when you get your blood work done, which you should be doing every year, um, one of the things they look for in addition to cholesterol is how much triglycerides you have in your blood. So, and of course they're put together with dehydration synthesis as are most things in the body, right? So let's take a look. What is a triglyceride? So I said a glycerol. So a glycerol you see is a, a small molecule, just three carbons in length. Um, and they have these oxygens that allow fatty acid chains to attach and it's a triglyceride because you have one two three fatty acid chains okay so now we can actually start thinking about saturated versus unsaturated fat now that we have this picture here I want you to look at this so this is a straight like lying flat straight chain fatty acid and so is this one but this one has a kink or bend and that bend is because of this double bond and this double bond has kicked off a hydrogen so notice all all these other straight chains are completely full or saturated with hydrogen but when you add a double bond you have to remove a hydrogen in order to, to be able to make that bond. So it's now unsaturated with, with hydrogen, right? And unsaturated fats are healthier than saturated fats. And that's because the double bond makes it kink or bend. This takes up more space. It now is going to be a liquid at room temperature and it's easier for the body to um, let, work with. Let's say it's uh, the unsaturated fats are what we consider the good fats that don't typically they are not going to get stuck on your arteries. They're not going to turn into plaques. Um, so that's why they're considered healthy. So if it's a mono unsaturated, it means you just have one double bond. If it's polyunsaturated, you're going to have more than one double bond. And it can be in the same fatty acid chain or it can be um, right in, in any of the three. Um, also, we have this terminology called cis configuration. Cis means same and same side so the remaining hydrogen are on the same side as each other and this is important because you've probably heard of trans fat right so trans fat is when the hydrogen end up on opposite sides from one another and that allows it to still be straight instead of causing that bend or kink so trans fats are unsaturated because you've still removed one of your hydrogens but they mimic saturated fat in that they lie flat and so they'll be solid at room temperature and this is why a lot of uh, processed foods will use trans fats because they uh, store on the shelf instead of like a refrigerator or they have a longer shelf life instead of expiring very quickly they help uh, get the texture, taste, or shelf life that the company wants to make more profit. But this is not natural. They're making this through um, hydrogenation is the process that they use to essentially add hydrogens back to polyunsaturated fats to end up um, making this, this weird... Um, orientation um, which changes the property right of being um, solid instead of liquid at room temperature and basically you've taken a healthy fat and you've made it unhealthy furthermore because this is not natural we do not have enzymes to deal with this and so um, trans fats really increase your risk of developing heart disease having stroke um, diabetes, 
they're very harmful. They raise your bad cholesterol and they lower your good cholesterol because you're using your good cholesterol to try to get rid of them. Um, it's just bad news. So really don't eat, avoid processed food first of all as much as you can. And then when you do have processed food, make sure you're reading the food label and avoiding anything with trans fat. So a lot of uh, chips, for example, um, chips, cookies, things that are, like I said, processed on the shelf, things that you tend to want to eat, right? <laughs> They're tempting, they taste good, You're, you might even crave them, right? Um, all right, I think that's enough talk about that. So complex lipids are going to have a more complicated, okay, so remember glycerol, it's a very small, simple molecule. Now we're going to be looking at like a phosphate head, for example, which is a much bigger, more complicated molecule. You don't need to memorize these uh, chemical structures, okay? Just know that it's called a phosphate group. Um, it's larger, more complicated, so it's a complex lipid. This, what we're looking at right here, is a phospholipid. This is showing what this round circle, so you always see phospholipids depicted as just a ball with two tails. What the ball is, is this complicated phos phosphate group. And then these tails are uh, fatty acid chains, right? Which uh, hydrocarbons essentially and um, you probably remember that cell membranes are composed of phospholipids and in two layers so it's called the phospholipid bilayer right so phospholipids contain a phosphate group and two fatty acid chains the head the phosphate circle right is polar but the fatty acid tails are are fat. They're a lipid, so they're a hydrocarbon. They're nonpolar. They're hydrophobic. All cells have a membrane made of phospholipid bilayer. Uh, cholesterol, which is not shown in in this picture, it's shown on the next slide. Uh, cholesterol is also a complex lipid, and it's actually also in cell membranes of animals and people included. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about that. Cholesterol is another type of complex lipid needed uh, and our, our focus in the class is that it's needed to make all of your steroid hormones. So all of your steroid hormones are derivatives of cholesterol. Um, that doesn't mean just go eat as much cholesterol as you want. You don't need to consume very much cholesterol at all. Very little cholesterol is needed in your diet. Um, we also use it in our cell membranes, as I mentioned, um, and that is for stability, okay? And so let's talk about the cell membranes a little bit. The cell membranes, also called plasma membranes, are made up of lipids, carbohydrates, and proteins. They're about 55% protein, um, and that makes sense because protein carries out um, all the function of the cell, right? Pretty much. Um, the lipids make up 42% of your cell membrane. And interestingly, the lipids are broken down further into the phospholipids and the cholesterol. Phospholipids are 25% of the total membrane and the cholesterol is 13% of the total membrane. And then you have about 4% of other unique lipids. And then the carbohydrates are only about, um, what, 13%? No, three, three, three. It's a very small amount, 3%. Okay, so cholesterol, as I mentioned, is the precursor for all of your steroid hormones. So you can see there's this uh, one, two, three, four ring structure with some, some side group that we, we don't care about the specifics of this but we care that you have this one, two, three, four ring structure. And every single steroid hormone is going to have that same one, two, three, four ring structure. Notice the other stuff's different. The side chains 
what they have going on um, outside of the rings will change, and that's how each hormone's different from one another. But they're identical in these four rings. Okay, so cholesterol is the precursor to steroid hormones. And hormones are chemical messengers in the body, right? Steroid hormones play a role in many, many physiological functions in the body, uh, including but not limited to the reproductive system. The role of cholesterol in the cell membrane, as I mentioned, is to maintain stability and anchor other molecules. And it also helps with... Uh, keeping the membrane loose or fluid when uh, temperatures get cold. So instead of um, becoming a solid and not functioning anymore, it can maintain a fluid um, environment in cold temperatures. Um, we won't worry about the chemistry of how that works. <laughs> okay, another example of lipids are called prostaglandins. You may have heard of these uh, before. They have a role in inflammation and pain. They also help control blood pressure. Uh, they help uh, play a role in dilation and constriction of blood vessels, so vasodilation or vasoconstriction. Um, very important in the contraction and relaxation of smooth muscle. And so uh, women, if you've experienced menstrual cramps, you can thank prostaglandins. <laughs> Uh, fatty acids with cyclic hydrocarbon group. So you're not worried about memorizing all this chemistry, right? But just, you can see that it has a cyclic ring, right? And it has two fatty acids sticking off of it. That's it. So all these different kinds of prostaglandins pretty much look the same. They have minor differences on their side, their side chains, right? Okay. Regulatory functions, as I mentioned, uh, blood vessel diameter, inflammation, clotting. I think I forgot to mention that one. That's important. All right. So contraction and relaxation of smooth muscle, vasodilation, vasoconstriction of blood vessels, control of blood pressure, clotting, and modulation of inflammation. So that plays a role in our immune response, our immunity. Um, and prostaglandins are unique in that they are not released from a gland like other hormones are. They're actually derived on the spot as needed uh, through an enzyme or enzymatic reaction. You take fatty acid, you take actually from the phospholipids of the membranes and you make from phospholipids, you make arachidonic acid, and you, I think you learned about that in um, anatomy. And then you can take that arachidonic acid and you can make prostaglandin. So that's interesting. So instead of having a gland that secretes this, like most hormones, we will just make it when we need it directly from the cells. All right. Ketones, I told you we would talk about these. We'll talk about them more throughout the class as well. Um, so ketones are not necessarily bad in and of themselves. It's just when you have too many of them. So what are they? Hydrolysis of triglycerides. And uh, so when you break down fat, right? Hydro, water, lysis, splitting. Hydrolysis, breaking apart of triglycerides you're going to end up with free fatty acids. And you can use those free fatty acids right away as an energy source, um, but you can also convert them into ketones to then get rid of them, okay? So when you have too many. Uh, but ketones are slightly acidic. And um, these are examples of, of, of a ketone. So when you are burning fat, you're going to have elevated levels of ketones and that's called ketosis. And this is normal and that's okay. But if you start to accumulate too many, then it's called ketoacidosis. And we really only see ketoacidosis in um, diabetes, type one diabetes, uh, 
and when people go on extreme diets like the keto diet so don't ever don't do extremes they're never good our body works very hard to maintain a safe environment why would you want to stress it out okay so ketoacidosis occurs when ketone bodies uh, accumulate in the blood to such a high amount that they actually lower the pH of your blood and this can be very dangerous if you lower your pH too much it can become life-threatening okay all right, proteins. You need to memorize that all proteins are made up of an amine group. Uh, I'm sorry, yes, an amine group, a carboxyl group, some side chain that we don't care about, but there will be some side group, okay? So this structure of NCC, right? Uh, amine connected to your carbon, and then your carboxyl group. This is all proteins, right? So, of course, we put these together. Uh, so this is an amino acid, right? Amino acids are the building blocks of proteins. You use dehydration synthesis to put them together. And when you put them together, that will make a peptide bond. So this is an amino acid. Know the structure of an amino acid. There are 20 different amino acid types in our body. Differences between amino acids are due to this R group, this side functional group. Otherwise, all other amino acids are going to have this structure. All right, so when you just make a bunch of peptide bonds, you put together uh, amino acid onto an amino acid onto amino acid, right? You just keep adding them. That's the primary structure. It's uh, polypeptide many peptides, right? Amino acid sequence. Okay, so that's what that is. And of course, remember, dehydration synthesis is how you put together amino acids to make your peptide bonds and to get your primary structure, your chain of amino acids. Then if you start to fold, if you start to get more shape, this is your secondary structure. And this can happen in two ways. A helix, which you see uh, here and here. And it can also happen with a beta pleated sheet, which is this crinkled looking shape here. And this is uh, happening because hydrogen bonds are forming uh, between amino acid uh, side chains. So those are groups. Okay. So it could coil up and into uh, alpha helix, single helix, or it can fold into a pleated sheet. Tertiary structure would be, now you have even more bonds happening. So the helix and the pleated sheets start to fold together into a three-dimensional shape. And you can also have disulfide bridges form. And, and this is when you have uh, two side chains of on amino acids that contain sulfur and then the sulfur bonds together and that's very strong covalent bond and so that really helps give the protein some some really strong structure um, you also will have more hydrogen bonds and you'll also have some ionic bonds happening so it's all the folding in the protein is due to interaction of side chains of your um, amino acids. And then you can put a bunch of those together, two or more of your tertiary structures, and that will give you quaternary structure. And this here is actually hemoglobin. So you have four subunits of tertiary structure put together to make your quaternary structure called a hemoglobin. We'll see this again later in class. All right, so many proteins are conjugated with other groups, meaning we add other stuff onto it. This can be glycoproteins where you've added, um, you've added like sugars, right? Uh, so glycoproteins contain carbohydrates. You've added a carbohydrate or sugar onto the protein. Uh, it could be a lipoprotein where you've added a fat, a lipid onto the protein. 
Um, so hemoglobin, um, which you probably noticed this funny looking uh, circle here, hemoglobin has been conjugated with a pigment that contains iron. So the heme group that contains iron uh, that gives it the function that we know uh, to bind oxygen, right? So here you have the number of polypeptide chains and what the non-protein component is and what it does in the body, right? So hemoglobin's the one I've been talking about. There's four, four of those uh, tertiary structures put together to give it quaternary structure. And the non-protein component, its conjugation is with the heme, heme pigment, and you know that its job is to carry oxygen in the blood. We also have myoglobin, and it only has one polypeptide chain, and it also has heme, um, and it stores oxygen in the muscle, so myo for muscle. Um, insulin has two polypeptide chains, so you've put two subunits together, uh, but it doesn't have anything conjugated to it at all. And insulin, as you know, is super important in the ability to take up sugar from the blood and into the cells of the tissues. Blood group proteins, don't worry about that. Lipoproteins, also, oh, we're not gonna worry about that either. Okay, but you should know hemoglobin and insulin for sure. Okay, so proteins are delicate kind of in that their function is completely dependent on their shape. So if you change their shape, that's it. That protein's done. It's useless. It's never going back. So you can hydrolyze them, meaning you break them apart with water and an enzyme. The enzyme's going to use water to split it apart. Um, you can denature them. A lot of you have learned this word about denature, but make sure you use it properly. So if you add enough heat to break uh, bonds so that the quaternary structure is lost, then it will no longer function and this is permanent. Another way you can denature a protein is a drastic change in pH to where you, again, you change the quaternary structure in that is permanent okay all right so um so what what would not be denaturing is a, a change in temperature that doesn't permanently you know it doesn't break bonds so like when you make it cold when you cool something down it moves more slowly it moves less it is slower and so all you have to do is warm it back up and you'll see more activity, okay? So when you see a loss of uh, enzyme function and it's cold, that is not denaturing. It's just, you just cooled it down. And once you warm it up, it will function again. But if you make something too, too hot, then there's no going back. All right. So we are almost finished. We have just a couple more slides. I want you to take a moment, think about DNA and write everything that you remember about DNA. So pause the video. All right, so maybe you remembered that DNA stands for deoxyribonucleic acid. Maybe you also remember that what that means, the deoxy, is that you have one um, less hydrogen on that sugar, and we'll see what that looks like in a minute. Um, genetic information or the genetic code, right? So maybe you were able to tell me that DNA is the genetic code. And that our DNA is stored in the nucleus of our cells as chromosomes. And it's the genetic code because it codes for proteins. The region of DNA that codes for proteins is called a gene. I forgot to write that down for you, but it's called a gene. The small segment of DNA that codes for protein is called a gene. 
DNA is copied, the whole DNA molecules copied before cell division. We will see that later in this course. And you know that DNA is made up of these uh, nitrogenous bases called A, T, C, G for short. Um, and those bases will pair together and we call it complementary base pairing, right? And you remember that A always binds to T and C always binds to G. And that's why we say A, T, C, G in that order. It helps us remember A to T, C to G. And you may have also remembered that DNA is actually two strands bonded together through hydrogen bonds to form a double helix. So the double helix is formed by hydrogen bonds between your nitrogenous bases. And so if you have bases sticking out and binding together to make the double helix, then the other part, the backbone, is the sugar phosphate part. And we'll see what that looks like. So you have your sugar phosphate, the circles are the phosphates, uh, the sugars are these sugars, right? And then the base is attached to them. And so when you make a strand, one strand of DNA, you have sugar, uh, sugar phosphate, sugar phosphate. So that's why we say sugar phosphate backbone. And sticking off of each of the sugars is the nitrogenous base. And G, as you may recall, is short for guanine, T, thymine, C, cytosine, A, adenine. So A, T, C, G. You can get another strand, which I think I show here, yes. Another strand of DNA. And so here we see the sugar phosphate backbone and the nitrogenous bases sticking out. Uh, so two strands of DNA and they are binding together to make this double helix by forming hydrogen bonds between complementary bases. What that means is C can bind to G by making these hydrogen bonds. It actually makes three. But C doesn't bind to A, okay? Only to G. And T only binds to A and it makes two hydrogen bonds. And that's why we get this, uh, the shape that we get of the double helix uh, is maintained through A binding to T and G binding to C. And it doesn't always go in this order, right? Uh, you can get a lot of different um, sequences. That is how you get the code for different proteins. Okay, so hopefully this has been a really good review for you for DNA. Uh, there's a lot of really uh, great videos uh, that I can send you if you want to uh, review more about DNA, if you're feeling a little lost um, and you need a little more review. Okay, now I want you to do the same thing for RNA. What can you tell me about RNA? Pause the video. Okay, so RNA uh, is going to be small pieces, so short strands. They are also single-stranded, just one piece. And these are, we, you probably best know RNA for mRNA, right? So the transcript, so that gene that we were talking about on DNA gets copied into a transcript of RNA and we call it messenger RNA because it's going to leave the nucleus and go into the cytoplasm to be translated into protein. So we'll see this process in another lecture uh, this week. RNA is not stored in the cell, right? DNA is stored in the cell as chromosomes. RNA is not. RNA is not our genetic code. We're not using it as the blueprint. We protect our DNA and we use the DNA as the uh, template for everything, right? So RNA is just a temporary, um, it's a temporary molecule 
to do a function, but it's it comes from the DNA, right? Uh, once mRNA is made, it has to leave the nucleus to get made and translated into protein. I already said that. We also have other types of RNA. Uh, there's a lot of types of RNA. We're not going to talk about all of them. You'll see more when you take microbiology. You'll learn about uh, micro RNAs and other uh, small RNAs. Um, but in our class, you will see rRNA and tRNA. R RNA is for ribosomes, and tRNA is used uh, to transfer the amino acids onto the uh, transcript within the ribosome to make your protein. So when we look at translation and transcription, um, I don't remember which chapter off the top of my head, but uh, probably metabolism. Uh, when we talk about translation and transcription, you will see these again. So um, don't feel too overwhelmed right now if you don't remember what RNA and tRNA and all these things are. This is just helping to jog your memory, start to get your memory, and introduce you to things so that when they come up again, you, you will be ready for it. Okay, so, and of course the obvious first thing maybe I should have started with is that RNA stands for ribonucleic acid and that's because it has a ribose sugar. So what is this deoxy and ribose, right, deoxyribose for DNA and just ribose for RNA? So let's take a look at that. So deoxyribose just has this hydrogen, but ribose has an OH, right? And so you've lost an oxygen when you have DNA. So it's deoxyribose because you've removed an oxygen. And you know what I think? I think my slide has an error on it. So please go back and fix this. Um, yes. <laughs> deoxyribose, deoxy, it's missing an oxygen. It only has an, an H. So please fix this. It should say missing an O for oxygen on the sugar. And then you can really circle this to help, okay? And so then a specific example, they give you thymine and, um, oh yes, so more differences between DNA and RNA. You know, we have the nitrogenous bases, A, T, C, G, T for thymine, but in RNA, all the T's are replaced with uracil. Okay, so two of the main differences between DNA and RNA are demonstrated here. RNA has OH on the sugar, deoxyribose only has an H. DNA has the nitrogenous base thymine, RNA has the nitrogenous base uracil. Okay, and last slide, ATP, adenosine triphosphate. Why is it called that? Well, remember the nitrogenous base adenosine it's attached to it is now three phosphate groups. And phosphate, as you might recall from chemistry, is highly electronegative, and they don't like being stacked onto each other like this. So when you allow that third phosphate group to be released, it releases a large amount of energy, and that is how we do all of the work in the cell, right? So ATP is cellular energy, there's energy stored in these bonds, and when you break one of these bonds, you release energy, which is used to do work. So glucose is broken down step by step in a process called cellular respiration to produce ATP. And that primarily happens uh, in the mitochondria, right? For us, it happens in the mitochondria. Okay. ATP is never stored in the body. It has to be used immediately. So we constantly are making it and using it. What we do store is glucose in the form of glycogen. Okay. Um, that's it. We are done. Good job.